So this is just about emission reduction, and it will be a little bit different from the lectures that have been so far. Uh, so this will be a little bit less hashing at the moment, uh, and um, go connection to hashing will start to appearing towards the end of this lecture, and especially in the lecture tomorrow. Uh, and, uh, and uh, but from the other perspective, this is uh, this is really about a lot of geometry. So this is kind of entering the realm of geometry. It will be mostly high dimensional geometry. And it has been at least partially motivated by some of Grant examples where we compute frequencies and, and eventually you have items and you can think about the frequency vector as being a high dimensional vector, right? You have n dimensions. And, um, and some of the tools for doing some hashing or some sketching uh, have, been, have been influenced by what has happened in high dimensional geometry or the tools from there, in particular just the Lichtenstein's lemma but that Graham mentioned. And uh, at least part, most of the lecture will be actually about just Lichtenstein's lemma. Um, and uh, before that I want to motivate a problem that uh, I, I want to give one particular problem that is one of the fundamental problems in high dimensional geometry, high dimensional computational geometry, and uh, it, it will be the problem that we'll be solving both today and tomorrow. And this problem is uh, nearest neighbor search. So, I mean, phrasing this problem in different uh, in different ways has been has motivated a lot of tools uh, and techniques in conventional geometry and perhaps in hashing as well. All right. So let me define the problem. Uh, so it's a data structure question where we have a set D of points. We want to preprocess them somehow. Uh, so that uh, later at query stage, we're given a point query Q, and we need to report the point that is closest, with the smallest distance to the point query Q, in this case, this point Q. Okay? Uh, so the motivation uh, is, so first of all, you know, this is high dimensional situation. So the dimension where the points come from can be really high dimension, and where does this come from? Uh, so this comes from kind of general area of similarity search, where we think about the points as being some objects. For example, they can be some depictions of images, and the distance can model dissimilarity measures. So these are, for example, we can think about the points as representing some kind of images. For example, these are images from a very classical data set called the NIST of handwritten images, and you can imagine that we have a bunch of images that are already labeled, whether this is a two or a seven and you are given a new image and you want to label whether this is perhaps a two and you do this by finding the most similar image and essentially using that label as a predictor. Uh, and uh, you know, how does this look, you know, why is this high dimensional problem? Well, you can, you know, one way to measure this is take this picture and essentially, you know, maybe assemble it down. Uh, so I think this is, these pictures are 28 by 28 pixels and you, write, you can write them as a binary matrix essentially, right? With 28 square dimensions, where each dimension is 0 or 1, or the corresponding pixel is 0 or 1. And you can compare the images, uh, you know, measure kind of the distance or similarity. The similarity with them is by computing timing distance between these two vectors, right? And these vectors are naturally high dimensional, 700 dimensions or so. Um, and uh, naturally, this, you know, I already mentioned that this is essentially, in machine learning, this is called the KNN rule, the nearest neighbor rule. This is a, one of the classical uh, classifiers. And uh, as such, it has, it, it has been used and is being used in, in many areas, uh, such as speech, image, video, recognition, or bioinformatics, uh, quantization, and so forth, right? Um, and uh, I mean, this looks a little bit of a naive way to, comp to measure the distance between images. And indeed, you can imagine different distances between, be, between such objects, for example, Hamming and Euclidean, uh, or edge distance, which would measure perhaps uh, you know, dissimilarity between text with, where you can do typos, or you know, even more complicated measures like f mover distance. And, uh, and indeed, for images, this is you know, perhaps a little bit too naive, but, but anything that is even more complicated will will capture, will have this problem uh, underlying it, at, at least this hard problem, right? Uh, so many of these other things will reduce to this kind of situation. Uh, and also, 
another perspective is that nearest neighbor search can actually be used as a primitive for many other problems in, in uh, geometric settings. Uh, for example, if we have a data set and we want to find the similar pairs or the closest pair problem, or if we want to do different kinds of clusterings. So many of these problems uh, will need nearest neighbor search in one form or the other. Uh, so it seems to be a fundamental problem here. And uh, there's a lot of research on kind of trying to solve this problem. And, uh, and you know, let's start with something you know, kind of very simple. Uh, very simple being, say, two-dimensional case. What happens in two-dimensional case? Before we go into high dimensional situation, so you know the classical data structure is to compute a Voronoi diagram, and you know, given a query point Q, you want to do what is called point location. Basically, given a point query Q, point location means finding this zone. Uh, I'm sure that you, you guys have seen this Voronoi diagram before, um, and uh, and basically, you know what what this data structure kind of achieves at the end is. You know, assuming you know good point location data structure, it, it will get kind of performance space which is linear in n, and is the number of points size of the data set and query time is order of n. Uh, I'm sure people tell me that this can be done more, more efficiently, but let's do it this way, right? Even achieving this will be really, really good in general. So in high-dimensional case, we won't be able to achieve this, right? But you know, even setting this up as as kind of golden goal would be really good. Um, so, um, so in high dimensional case, unfortunately, we can, um, I mean, there are essentially two extremes of what we can do. Uh, things become much harder. Um, and uh, all the exact algorithms degrade very rapidly with, uh, with dimension D. Uh, and um, there are essentially two things that you can do, kind of two extremes. One is to do the similar thing, kind of, you know, a boring diagram for dimension D. Uh, and uh, you can do it, uh, and it will have kind of nice query time, something like log n times dimension. You can often think about dimension as being, let's say, logarithmic. Uh, space. Uh, the space, the space unfortunately will be something like exponential in dimension, right? Which is just not not practical, it's not the work. Um, the other option is to not do anything, essentially, you know, to be lazy and uh, not to do any preprocessing, and then you will have a very nice space. Obviously, the query time will be something like n times d. Okay, so this is the situation, and you know, this motivated studying approximation algorithms. And uh, tomorrow we'll see some more uh, algorithms for this. Uh, but this is this is kind of a problem. This is a problem to keep in mind. And uh, so I just wanted kind of to introduce this problem and you know this will be one case where say the machine reduction will help a little bit. Uh, okay, so so this was a problem, this was kind of an aside, kind of a motivating kind of example to keep to keep up there. Uh, so going back to the machine reduction, uh, here is you know here is kind of a natural thing to do. Uh, so if the, if high dimension is really a problem and and you know, this is the slide that you know, should really tell you that you know, high dimension is really a problem. But you know, this, all this is, has a name, it's called curse of dimensionality, kind of the higher dimension, the worse it is. Uh, so one approach is like, okay, so if dimension is high, can we, can we reduce it perhaps? You know, is there a way to, is, is, is high dimension really necessary? And this is, I mean, this is one motivation kind of for dimension reduction. Uh, so, if it, you know, if it is high, let's try to reduce it. And, you know, we'll think of original dimension as being D, and uh, the smaller dimension, the target dimension, as being K. And these are the numbers that will be, these are the letters we'll be using for the rest of the talk. And uh, lecture. And uh, yeah, I guess pictorially, you know, here we have a bunch of points in three dimensional space. Maybe we can reduce them to one dimension while preserving all the distances. Right, so if we can do this, we kind of get rid of this curse of dimensionality, right? And um, in general, this is not possible. I mean, if uh, kind of, you know, some of the classical things in geometry will tell you, like, well, if you have these points and they really have this two-dimensional or three-dimensional structure, you cannot just flatten them out. Some distances will be distorted. Some, some distances will go to zero, for example, right? There is nothing, nothing that one can do. But it turns out that one can do uh, if, one, one can do dimension reduction if one thinks not about the entire, uh, the entire say, three-dimensional space or high-dimensional space, but thinks about particular set of points. 
So if we had a particular set of, say, n points in, in, um, in, in high dimensional space, we can try to do the machine reduction. And, uh, and this is the classical Joshua and Lemma from 1984. And you know, most of the lecture will be about it. And uh, let, let, us, you know, let us see what kind of, uh, you know, what does it mean, for example, for our nearest neighbor search application. Uh, so as I mentioned, you know, one of the kind of, you know, the real, the only real, really practical algorithm that is for nearest neighbor search exactly is not to do anything and then to do trivial scan, right? And trivial scan of all the points will take time, which is n times the dimension. Right? This is the query time, because for each point in the data set, uh, we will compute the distance, computing the distance, the under Euclidean distance, it takes time v. Right, order dimension. And uh, if, we, if we have such a dimension reduction into much smaller dimension k, we can at least do this. We can reduce the query time to something like order of n times k plus time to reduce, uh, re uh, to do the dimension reduction for our query point. Right, so, I mean, assuming this is, this is relatively small, I mean, this, in particular, this should not depend on n, right, in, should not have a strong dependence on n, we have reduced essentially the query time from n times g to n times k. Right? Um, this, this, is, by the way, this seems like, you know, like a, a small reduction kind of. I mean, I have to tell you like what, what is k and stuff. And we'll go there. Uh, the idea is that, you know, k will generally be much smaller than I mentioned d. And this seems like, you know, like we, we've made a small step. And, and the truth is that in practice, a lot of the nearest neighbor search is solved this way. Essentially, there is people do dimension reduction, and then essentially you do a linear scan. And there are many reasons for it, you know, some, some related to caching, some, some related to being able to reduce dimension to very small k, and do these distance computations very, very fast. Um, but, I mean, but this is something that does happen in practice. Um, they have dimension reductions are a little bit more, more specific, but I mean, they're essentially motivated by Johnson and Schultz lemma. Okay, so this is the application. This is kind of you know what we want to achieve. So now let's talk about the actual dimension reduction. Right. Uh, so you just I'm curious how fast I should be going. How how many of you have seen Johnson and Strauss or the proof of it? Okay. Okay. Good. So I guess about forty percent normal speed. Um, all right, so, so this is the statement. Um, so just to be clear, you know, what exactly we're approving. Um, so the approving is the following. So first of all, it is um, basically will be a map. Uh, so notational, notation L2 denotes Euclidean space. Um, uh, so 2 to V essentially denotes Euclidean space of dimension D. This is Euclidean space of dimension k. Uh, so we're saying that there is a linear map, randomized uh, linear map, let's say function, essentially, f, that maps <coughs> high dimensional space, high dimensional Euclidean space of dimension d to dimension k, that preserves the distances between any two vectors, for, between any given vectors x and y, up to factor 1 plus epsilon. And this is what it means exactly to preserve distance up to factor 1 plus epsilon, right? And this is with some probability. And this is, this is essentially what is the probability. So the probability, this is the probability of failure. And the probability of failure that we you know, should really kind of, how you should think about it, is that it's really the case exponentially of the target dimension k. There is some dependence on epsilon on the target dimension, and you can think about epsilon as being a constant. But the idea uh, is that the probability decays exponentially in the target dimension k. No, so for any... For each pair. So you construct a function f, right, which is just, it's a, it's a function f that doesn't, doesn't see anything, essentially. It's oblivious, as it's called, such that for any given x and y, it will, this holds with this probability. This inequality holds with this probability, right, for any x and y. Right, 
is it? Can so you repeat what is, the question? Sorry? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so the question is, if it is a randomized linear map, doesn't this imply uh, get probabilistic, by probabilistic method, right, that there exists a function f? So, in some sense, for a, for a particular two vectors, x and y, yes, this is indeed the case. For particular x and y, there exists a function f that will achieve this. But what we're saying is that there exists a randomized linear f that works for all x and y with some probability at the same time. Uh, it, it does not imply, this does not imply that it will work, that there exists an f that will work for all x and y at the same time. Basically, depending on how f is chosen, it will work for some pairs, but not for all other pairs. Uh, I mean, we, we know that it cannot work for all pairs, and so why just by pecking bump? We cannot, we cannot flatten a high dimensional space into a smaller dimensional space. But it, it will work for parts of the space, kind of. And, you know, how can we use this, right? So, for example, for nearest neighbor, nearest neighbor application, we need to really preserve the distances between n pairs, right? These pairs being the query point and every of the data set points, right? And there are n pairs, and, and this is, n sorry? Squared. N squared pairs. We don't care about distances between pay points in the data structure, data set itself. If I, if I want to compute a nearest neighbor, what, I, what the distances that I need is the distance between the query, point number one in data set, point number two in data set, point number three in data set, and so forth. There are n pairs only between the query and every, everything in the data set. It's not as squared because you don't, you don't care about distances of points inside the data set. Right? Anyway, so you have to, uh, it should be n pairs. Uh, so if you want to preserve distances about n pairs, you want this probability to be something like 1 over 1 over n. And if you plug in the numbers, then essentially the target dimension that you need what you need to set k to be is log n divided by epsilon squared. Okay, so if we say we use the k, then this, this failure probability becomes inversely polynomial in that. And uh, remember when time to compute, um, you know, we'll care about what is the time to compute this map, and time to compute this map will be actually uh, k times this. Um, I mean, you don't see yet why, but we'll see later why. Okay, thanks. Okay? All right. Uh, so this is the statement. I mean, if there are questions about the statement, now is a good time to ask. Um, all right. So, so basically, you know, now, now we'll show how to construct it and why it works. Uh, and uh, the really the idea is to project the, the data set, the project the space, so this map is really a projection into a random k-dimensional subspace, right? So we start with a really big d-dimensional space. We take a random subspace of dimension k, and we project the point there. Okay, this is it. Uh, <coughs> now let me, uh, you know, let's let, let's go slower a little bit. Um, so. You know, the statement even makes sense for k equals 1, so let's try to construct some kind of embedding into one-dimensional space. Right, so for one-dimensional space, we will say, basically, the statement says that there will be some constant approximation of constant probability. Right, so let's do at least that. And what do we do for, for k equals 1? Here is, here is the embedding. Here is this map. Right, the map is very simple. Uh, it is just a sum of, uh, so mapping a point x is just the sum of j's times, times xi, xi times of the coordinates, right? And j's are normal Gaussian distributions. Okay, so you choose j's from this normal distribution and this is your map. And um, again, this is the picture of the Gaussian distribution. You know, this is the probability distribution function. You know, some first two moments. Um, so it's centrally distributed and uh, has variance one, essentially, is what it says. Um, so why Gaussian? Um, so 
I mean, I want to avoid as much as possible formulas. I mean, obviously, some things we had with some geometry kind of will involve formulas. But uh, I really want to kind of give the intuition. And this is the intuition. So why Gaussian? Really, why we use Gaussian is because of what is called stability property. Namely that for any, for any Xi, if we take this kind of sum of J times Xi, it is a random variable, right? It depends on, on the Gis, right? And it is distributed as norm L2 norm of X, basically Euclidean length of X times G, where G is another random variable, and it is distributed as a Gaussian. Right, this is, this is V property that we, that we use, right? And you know, if you, if you haven't seen this property before, then you know, this is what you should remember for, from this lecture to start with, right? Um, and uh, another way to, to say this, the same thing, uh, it's essentially equivalent, uh, is to say that if we take this vector, uh, take a d-dimensional vector which, whose coordinates are g1, g2, up to gd, right? it's a random vector, then it is centrally distributed, in, uh, meaning that if we take this, I think there is a picture, if we take this, uh, if we take a vector which is distributed according to this distribution, then it has a random direction in the dimensional space. Okay? Uh, so basically these two vectors that should be of the same length um, have the same probability of appearing. Okay, and uh, if we, so then this sum can be seen as a projection of a vector x on this vector g, right? And since it's symmetric, then this sum can only depend on the length of x, right? Because there is no direction that is preferred. So then we can only depend on the length of x, and essentially, this should be some kind of length of x times some random variable, and it happens to be also Gaussian. Okay, and uh, to see why this is centrally distributed, uh, I don't have any kind of better intuition than essentially you know, writing two line proof. If you you know plug in PDF kind of, and you look you know how does a two dimensional Gaussian look like, and essentially PDF will depend just on the on the length. Basically, A and B are the coordinates, you know, to depend only on the length, on the distance from the center, right? So basically, using the stability, essentially this means that this sum, which is, you know, essentially our function, depends on the two norm of x, right, times some Gaussian variable. So, you know, it goes in the right direction, right? I mean, it, it, at least it, it doesn't depend on the structure of x, it depends only on the length of x. So, you know, let, let me complete the proof for, for this one-dimensional embedding. So again, our map, uh, our map is this sum of Gaussian times Xi. And for any X, this, this, this F of X is distributed as two Euclidean norm of X times some Gaussian variable. Okay? Um, so one additional property that I, I think Graham mentioned that is very useful in sketching is uh, that this map is linear meaning that it satisfies this, this equality and, you know, it simplifies also the sum of the proofs. Um, so, okay, so, you know, to prove the dimension reduction in one dimension, we want to prove that after we reduce the dimension, essentially, if we compute the Euclidean distance in, in one dimension, then essentially we say that this distance between f of x and f of y is, should be roughly equal to the original Euclidean distance between x and y, at least we good probability. Then this is what it says. Uh, and uh, because of linearity, it is okay to, to essentially talk about norms as opposed to distances, meaning just to say that, uh, you know, if you define z to be equal to x minus y, then this is equivalent to saying that f of x, the, the absolute value of f of x is roughly equal to the norm of Euclidean norm of z. This is uh, absolute value of f of z is up to z approximately equal to the Euclidean length of Z. Um, and the proof is, is equivalent to prove that the squares of these are roughly equal. Uh, and now, you know, essentially here is a claim and, you know, it, it really follows very simply that um, 
for any for any x and y if z is equal to x minus y, then first of all the expectation of this is the right is is right. Uh, and standardization will be small, proportional to the um, proportional to the expectation. Right, so this this essentially will, will prove that uh, that these holds up to constant approximation of constant probability. Uh, and I mean the proofs are really simple and just follow from kind of Gaussian distribution properties. For example, the expectation, you, know, you compute what is the expectation? The expectation of f of z squared, you know, if you plug in what is f of z, which is exactly a linear norm of z times Gaussian squared, right, using this property. And uh, this is exactly equal to length of z squared. Right, and I won't compute with the standard deviation, but it is exactly the same type of calculation. Okay, so, I mean, again, the stability property is what's here. And now, just going for full dimensional reduction, I mean, it doesn't look much different from one dimensional reduction. What we do is we have k coordinates that are look exactly the same. Okay? Um, so basically, f of x, so our entire map, will be just a lot of products between x and this Gaussian, high dimensional Gaussian vector. Right, so now G1 is a d-dimensional vector whose each coordinate is distributed as a Gaussian variable. And you have k of these, I mean basically the target dimension. You have this divided by root k, which is just a normalization constant, just to make sure that you know we get the, num the right scaling. And uh, another way, a much more convenient way to look at this is to say that this is essentially equal to x multiplied by a matrix G. Uh, with the scaling factor in front, where G just, uh, just pictorially will look something like this. So this is dimension D, this is K, and this is our vector X. Right? So this is this will be our vector X. Right? Um, okay. So so the actual map where this map G is really each entry is uh, identically distributed as a Gaussian variable. Okay? And again, now, you know, now what we want to prove from this is that, uh, again, norm of uh, f of z is, is, is an approximation, multiple sensible approximation to the original vector of uh, vector z. Again, so for z being x minus y. Uh, if we, I mean, we're looking at the distance between two points, x and y. And we want that the probability that this happens is uh, exponentially, uh, that the failure probability is exponentially high in k. I'm not sure whether it is too slow or too quick. Okay, good. Um, all right. So, um, so again, I mean, I, I won't fully prove this, but I mean, I'll show you essentially why this is so. Okay. But if we take, if, if we repeat just this one-dimensional embedding k times, then essentially we will get concentration such that the failure probability is exponentially, exponentially small. Um, so okay, uh, concentration. Um, so again, using the stability property, each of these coordinates is distributed as the length of z times some Gaussian Gaussian random variable, right? So using the stability property on each particular coordinate, essentially for each row of that matrix G, um, we get we, we get this, right? And then you know you you compute what is the norm of f of z. So the norm of f of z, you can you can pluck out this uh, norm of z squared you know, separately because it's a common term to everything. And then you have uh, basically this term, uh, which is one over k. This comes from the normalization, this normalization one over root k. 
sum over dimension i of ai squared, where ai, again, is distributed as Gaussian. Right? So this is, this is what, what we get as, as a norm. And uh, what we want to prove is that this is, uh, concentrates around norm of z squared. Which essentially requires us to prove that these, uh, these random variables concentrates around one with very good probability. And uh, so this distribution, I mean, this results in some kind of random variable. Note that it doesn't have any parameters except for uh, k. And uh, so it actually has a name. Uh, again, if you want to impress your friends, right? Some fancy names, it's called chi square distribution of k degrees of freedom. Um, and, uh, you know, this is where, you know, I'll just pull a fact. Uh, but, you know, this distribution actually concentrates very well. Uh, the, the idea being the following I mean, it's not, you know, like one can compute it, right? And, uh, and prove. But, I mean, the idea is that, you know, it is not surprising that this happens. Namely, this is a sum. Of, of essentially squares of Gaussians. So Gaussians concentrate well, right? And we have some of k things, right? And some of k things usually concentrate as uh, exponentially well in k squares. And it is essentially back into central limit fresh. Not that it is. The, the, the good part, I mean, why this, this holds is that this, this part does not depend on any of our x's or z's, right? It, it really depends just on k, so it is, it is a random variable that depends just on k. I mean, it, it requires this fact that I didn't prove, but you know, if, if you really want, uh, we can prove it. Um, and uh, just to wrap up what, you know, what I have to say about this as well is that, you know, this is, this is essentially the, again, this is the map, which is just, you know, the best way to see it is essentially up to normalization factor. It is just a matrix G times X, where matrix G is this K by D, matrix where each entry is distributed as a Gaussian variable. And uh, then just with Strong's lemma it says that basically the norm of f of x is a one percent approximation of the original norm of x. Um, so one no, uh, going to discover um, one, one thing that um, has been proven uh, in particular by uh, uh, this paper is that you can use uh, one plus seven, one plus minus one instead of Gaussians. So with matrix G, it, it is okay if it is actually each entry is a random plus minus one as opposed to a Gaussian variable, which is a little bit nicer because you, you just sum up numbers as opposed to multiply by these Gaussian distributed variables. And uh, as Graham you mentioned, this is actually related to, to original to Alain Mathieu's legacy <coughs> paper, uh, which showed how to do, how to estimate L2 norm in, in streaming fashion. The difference being that Johnson and Strauss, I guess, uh, one, it has appeared about a decade earlier. Uh, two is that it actually proves a high, uh, high probability bound. Okay? Uh, and there are disadvantages also about, you know, it takes more time to compute and it uses more random. Right, so, you know, um, so it has this advantage as well. Okay. Uh, so actually, this is, I mean, so this is what I want to say about, you know, the original just in this house. Uh, uh, the next thing is really I wanted to discuss what is uh, about the time to compute the just in this house. Are there questions about the lemma itself?
the, the next thing we'll try to do is actually to speed it up. So, okay. Um, all right, so this is, you know, again, this is, this is, this is how the, the embedding looks like, right? And now, you know, what is the time to compute this function of x for a given x? It is essentially a product of a matrix with x, and uh, the time it takes is k times d, because our matrix is of size k times d. And it is a dense matrix, so, you know, we have to compute it. And uh, at the same time, you know, it is a natural question to say, can we do it faster? I mean, we have an input of size d, the output is of size k. You know, maybe we can do in essentially order d plus k time. It should be order d time, since k should be smaller than d. Yes. In the end, you want to uh, have an addition of two things, right? One is the time it takes to do this uh, reduction, and then the other thing is something of the order k times d, right? Sorry? And then, then afterwards you would do this trivial scan. What mm -hmm. was the what is the thing you are adding? Sorry, I oh, just you mean Oh it's it's you mean the n times k plus yeah, k. Yeah, n times k of course. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so yeah, I mean also there is it, 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 it is in the pan kind of question. But so the regression reduction is used in many other places. So near okay. research is probably one of the very simple applications. It is actually used in many other places as well. And uh, it, it would be very nice to try to make it faster, actually. Um, but yes, I mean, this is, near research is one of the applications. It's also, you know, I gave one, of the, one way to use the machine reduction for nearest neighbor search, which was particularly simple to say, but there are other ways to use it also for nearest neighbor search and for other applications. And there, this difference would make a difference, actually. I mean, making your trials faster will make a difference. Okay. Um, but, you know, so this is, so general trials is probably one of the pillars of hydrogen geometry. Um, and it relates to things like concentration of measure. And, uh, I mean, it should relate to other things in hydrogen geometry making, making faster, essentially. And, um, yeah, I mean, it is it is a question itself. Okay. Um, all right. So, and the answer, you know, why I'm talking about this? Yes, I mean, we can make it faster. I mean, perhaps we want to choose D plus K. But uh, what what I'll show you today is essentially this time, which is uh, it should be actually D log D uh, plus some polynomial in K, it will be K cube, uh, which is due to Alan and Chazelle who first introduced the notion of faster than just having a shout then. Okay? Um, okay, so this is this is what we do uh, for most of the rest of the talk. D log D plus K sorry, so yeah that one should be D log D first of all. Um, yeah, I, I believe that AL11 achieves D log D plus K. So this is what we will achieve uh, today. This is the answer to the paper. Um, yeah, yeah, I have to check actually. I, I forgot to check this one. Um, all right, so, but I mean, there are other, also other directions where one can improve the student's house to take and national data. Um, all right, so uh, so how are we going to do this, right? And I mean, what is what is the problem? So the problem here is that, you know, this is this is the picture, right? This is a matrix G. It is a dense matrix. Remember, it is every entry distributed as a Gaussian or maybe as a random plus minus one. And uh, you need to multiply by vector x, right? And, um, okay, I mean, if you were to do this, you know, basically there is so much information in GG that essentially we have to touch it all, right? Uh, or at least this is the expectation. And, um, and really it is costly because the matrix G is dense, right? So the meta approach is to try to say like, okay, can we use a matrix G which is much sparser? So perhaps we don't need to use a very dense 
matrix G, but we can use a sparse matrix G. And you know, maybe this will give us something, right? And uh, you know, to some degree we'll be doing that, but it doesn't work uh, directly. Um, so suppose we uh, essentially, let, let me introduce this parameter S, which, is, which essentially says how many non-zero entries we have per row. Okay, so maybe we'll say that, okay, in each row we'll have S non-zero entries, which we choose randomly, and those entries will be random Gaussian variables, right? Um, and, you know, let's see what happens, right? I mean, we can try to redo the same kind of analysis that we did for Jensen and Schrauss, and uh, again, kind of doing one-dimensional embedding corresponds to looking what happens in one particular row, right? One particular row corresponds to one, one coordinate. And, uh, um, so let, let me denote this function h uh, to say which of the entries of g have been sampled, right? Uh, so h of y will be equal to 1 with probability s divided by d, that's essentially to give you some form of sparsity s per row. And essentially the, what we get is that z1, the, the first coordinate of z, right? Or of, you know, what, what is given, say, by one dimensional embedding is that it will be some eta, eta, this is just some normalization constant, we'll figure out later what it is, um, times the sum of h of i, wherever the element i has been sampled, and if it was sampled, then we multiply it by some random Gaussian times the coordinate of x i. Uh, this is what we get. And uh, I, again, kind of, you know, it, it is useful to work with squares for the numbers just because numbers work out much nicer. Um, you can compute the expectation of z1 squared. And we want this expectation of z1 squared to be roughly equal to, say, norm of x squared. And uh, so this is just eta squared, the normalization constant. And this is just expectation of this sum. And there is one step that, uh, uh, that I need to write. So there used to be a chop somewhere. Well, he didn't, huh? um, all right, so the step, uh, the step from going from here to here is, is very similar to what uh, Grant mentioned in, uh, for computing the AMS sketch. Um, namely, so let me just compute this exactly. Uh, so expectation of Z1 square is roughly equal to, is, well, roughly equal, uh, expectation of that sum, so this is eta squared, times um, sum of h of i times g i x i square. And again, this is the square. Now, this, uh, so this is, this is a sum which is square. And there are two types of terms. One, uh, one, one form of terms are something of this sort. Sum of i uh, equals from 1 to d. Uh, h of i, j, x i, all square. Plus the sum of i not equal to j of h of i, j, x i times h of j times g, j, x, j. Basically, these are sums corresponding to the same term, the products of the same term, and these are the cross terms. And because, so this is, this is all under expectation, right? this is equal to eta squared times expectation for this. Right? And again, uh, because uh, gi and gj for different coordinates i and j are independent and, uh, and centrally distributed, this is equal to zero. So this is always equal to zero. Because the expectation of j is zero, expectation of j. What happens is that if these two coordinates collide, which can happen with probability something like one over k, then we will lose this signal. And uh, the probability that we collide is roughly one over k, whereas we want a failure probability to be exponential in k. Okay? 
Um, so this is this is the main problem. So <coughs> so you know if you compute you know what what kind of sparsity do we need to you know to address this problem? Turns out that in the end we need sparsity which is roughly equal to d. Uh, what we need to increase a lot uh, the number of budgets, but then I mean then in the end we lose again. Right? This means that each element again has to be cached a lot, um, and in the end if you compute the numbers we will, we will not have saved on time. Um, but you know at least this analogy with hashing says that. Well, at least if X is kind of spread around, then perhaps we can get some kind of concentration per bucket, right? If, if each coordinate of X is really, really small and it is not overly disbalanced, then we can, then perhaps it works. Uh, perhaps kind of, you know, hashing intuition will say, but well, we'll have each bucket to kind of concentrate around what it should be. Um, so, you know, like I'm, I'm I'm using a lot of kind of intuitive phrases here. I mean, we'll formalize it later. I'm just trying to give intuition before I do formalize. Um, all right, so the new plan would be the following. So first, we would like to spread around x and then use a sparse g. Okay? And this is how we implement this plan. So this is, this is the map. Again, this is written in matrix notation. Uh, and, uh, this, these letters are not chosen by me, these are chosen by Alon and Chazelle, uh, and you know, at that moment was a PhD student, so I, I'm not sure whether this has a connection or not. But uh, anyway, so, so, Z, so this is a map, I mean, the output Z is equal to product of these three matrices times vector X. So again, it is a linear map, and it goes through a product of three matrices. And uh, I will, explain what are these matrices, and, but I also want to draw roughly how large they are, so that at least you see pictorially what it means. Okay, so originally we had something like z is equal to this matrix, which is k by d, times this x. So this is originally, right? So now this is, as I've mentioned before, FJLT stands for fast jumping the South transform. Uh, we'll have Z, which is roughly equal to like this. This is K, this is D, this is matrix C. This is matrix H, which is of size D by D. There is another matrix D is also dividing, and then we have our vector x. Okay, this is how it looks. Now, what are these matrices? Uh, so, starting from right to left, d is diagonal. So, when this is what we like, if I were to tell you much about matrices d and h, this looks even worse than before. I mean, this is like multiplying x by d by d matrix which will take you d squared sign, right? As opposed to d times k. Uh, so, you know, hopefully these matrices have more structure to them so that we can do this multiplication faster. And indeed, they do have structure. In particular, this matrix D just has all the, all the non-zeros are only the diagonal. It's really just a diagonal matrix. Basically, it multiplies each coordinate of x by some number. And in particular, each coordinate of it, this is a random plus minus one. Okay. Uh, matrix H is what is called Hadamard matrix, and it's essentially the matrix corresponding to the Fourier transform. Okay. It is a matrix that where each coordinate, it is, it is a deterministic matrix, it is not a randomized matrix, uh, as opposed to the other two matrices, and uh, it's a very fixed matrix, I mean, one can write it out of the piece, but I mean, it's not particularly helpful. Um, if you know what is Fourier transform, then this is essentially matrix corresponding to Fourier transform. If you don't know what is Fourier transform, then essentially the properties that we need from this matrix is that each entry is a plus minus one 
again, not random, it's a concrete structured matrix of plus minus ones. Uh, actually, sorry, not plus minus one, but plus minus one divided by root d. Again, one over root d is just normalization. Um, and the properties that we need from this matrix is one that this property, uh, two that it is a basis change. So if you think about this matrix as being an operator in Euclidean space, where essentially, I mean, it is, it is some linear transform which you can think about as a function, which essentially is a rotation in Euclidean space. In dimensional space, it's just a rotation which preserves the norm. And finally, I, I, the most interesting part of this, of this matrix is that the product, basically computing h times x, can be computed in d log d time. So this is the faster transform. Yes. So you're actually you're saying that H D is a uh, uh, together make a completely random uh, what's it called a basis change. And given that you don't if you don't know anything about X, then after making a completely random basis change, then it will be spread out. Uh, to some degree, this is the intuition. Okay. Yes. Uh, except that it is not a completely random uh, rotation. Okay. Yeah. So, describe a completely random rotation, you roughly need d squared degrees of freedom. You need a random, a random orthogonal matrix, which roughly will take d squared random numbers, right? Mm. Uh, or, you know, this is the dimension of the change, right? Whereas these has only d random numbers, right? On the diagonal. So, it uses much less random. If you were to have d squared random numbers to do random rotation, that would be bad, right? Because then, yeah. in some sense, you know, we haven't achieved much, right? Like the random dimensional reduction really says that, you know, I'll take a random k dimensional subspace, right? So I don't even need to do the entire random rotation, right? Mm. Here it is, I mean, it is, think about, uh, like this is the right intuition, except that think about that uh, HD is a, a right kind of lower randomness approximation of this intuition. Yeah, and, and P is, uh, just continuing the presentation, is this projection matrix. Essentially, you know, what we thought originally of was G. Uh, it will, we will achieve, uh, will not achieve optimal dimension, target dimension, we will achieve something K prime, which is what was originally called K. So we'll achieve a slightly higher dimension. And yes, you know, the intuition is completely right, but these two matrices are achieving, you know, what what we call intuitively spreading around, right? I mean, to make access being roughly, roughly uniform. Okay, so, and basically the proof will be, you know, the proof that this works will be to prove that these two matrices together achieve the purpose of spreading around, right? uh, and that, you know, once we spread around X, then the projection works. So this is, I mean, there are two things to prove, right? That one, this works, right? This doesn't be indeed achieve the machine reduction. Part one, part two, to show that this can be done fast. The part that this can be done fast should be kind of obvious by now, right? So it is multiplication by three, three matrices. This matrix is particularly simple, right? It's just diagonal. So it's just linear in dimension of x. It just multiplies each coordinate of x by some number. This is a fast Fourier transform. This can be done in D log D. So from time perspective, this is the most non-trivial part. Uh, and this will be projection, which will be a sparse projection. Uh, so it will be particularly simple. Okay. Um, so, you know, first a slide on intuition of spreading around. Um, so the idea is the following, right? The, the problem, the original, the original problem why projection didn't work was that, um, you know, it was really bad for axes which are sparse. So, uh, and, you know, one, one addition to this Fourier transform is that Fourier transform has what is called uncertainty principle that if you take x which was sparse and you compute h of x, then h of x tends to be not sparse, to be dense. Okay, I mean, this can be formalized exactly what it means, but I mean, this is not exactly how we're using it, so I, I won't quantify these, these terms. Uh, in particular, because, I mean, it works, so 
doing Fourier transform on sparse X works well and makes it dense, which means that you know mass of X is mostly spread around, you know, so achieves the purpose of spreading around. Now of course it is a basis change. This means that there are X's, original X's, such that H of X after the transformation becomes sparse, right? And in particular, this is the situation when X was dense at the beginning, right? Uh, so then, it, in some sense, it breaks things, right? Um, and uh, and this is the reason why we need this matrix D and why it is random. So D introduces enough randomness that the Hadamard matrix does not break things. This is rough intuition. Um, so now let's prove that these things work. Uh, the proof works a little bit more directly than uh, this intuition. Um, so let me just, okay, call Y this transformation, H, D, X. Uh, what we want to prove from this Y is that it is mostly kind of most of the mass, I mean, that Y is not concentrated on few coordinates. It is the mass is mostly spread around. Uh, let me just, you know, assume that X, norm of X is equal to one. Since this is linear, basically the norm of X does not matter, right? I mean, it is no, the same out to scale. Um, so, again, what is ideal spreading around? This is what, this is what would be ideal spreading around, right? We want that the norm of Y, the final norm of Y is still one. I mean, this should not change the, you know, the main purpose of all this is to not change that one. And, uh, and then we have D coordinate. So, you know, what is the ideal vector that has uh, D coordinates and has norm one? and doesn't have one coordinate to be too large, you know, this is, this is the right number. It's plus minus one over D. Okay? On each coordinate. Um, and uh, what will show that, basically, for that particular HDX, this is what we achieve. That the square, I mean, in this case, we're all squares, but, you know, is that the right square, the square root, but the square of yi uh, will be at most order log 1 over delta times 1 over d, so you know, 1 over d is just square of this, with probability at least 1 over delta for each coordinate i. Right, so we have, you know, so this is the ideal spreading around. What I'm saying is that what we'll have, I mean, we'll have by a factor of order log 1 over d more than this ideal spreading around on each coordinate i with good probability. Okay? <coughs> and uh, let me show the proof. It's kind of simple. Um, model, you have to believe this somewhere. But, uh, so yi is equal to this, where hi is i for all this Hadamard matrix. And again, we don't really care about, you know, what is the actual structure of the Hadamard matrix of this Fourier transform, except that each entry of H is either plus 1 over root D or minus 1 over root D. Okay? So if you look what it is, right, then, uh, then YI will be equal to this, right, exactly equals to G times X, where G, you know, is, is this vector. Um, and essentially each coordinate of, of G is a random plus minus 1 over G. So, I mean, again, this is, think about, so G is really equal as a, you know, this is a vector, HI, just a row of uh, Hadamard matrix, times this diagonal matrix. This diagonal matrix on each, on each diagonal entry has a random plus minus 1. This vector has a deterministic plus minus one over root d, which coordinate. So overall, you know, the product of these two will give us a vector g, where each coordinate uh, is a random plus minus one over root d. I, and it should be simple. Um, I hope I don't make things more complicated than they should be. Um, so it is a random, random vector uh, plus minus one over root d. Um, so, and now we multiply this vector g by x, right? Um, so here is, you know, a slight bit of case. Namely that uh, once we multiply this g times x, then yi 
is, a, is essentially uh, distributed as 1 over root d again. 1 over root d is just this normalization constant times a Gaussian vector. And uh, I mean, why is this the case? I mean, so if g, if g were not to be plus random plus minus 1 or 1 over root d, but to be a Gaussian vector, then this would just immediately follow from stability. That's something that I mentioned. So now we, instead of Gaussians, we actually use random plus minus ones, right? Uh, so I already mentioned in passing that replacing Gaussians of random plus minus ones works. And, uh, and it works here as well. Um, so while this is not particularly <coughs> true, the second line is true. Um, so let me, um, so basically, I mean, if it is time at the end, it is, it is a very simple kind of intuitive proof to, to show that switching in the three dimensional geometry and kind of switching from, uh, from random plus minus ones to Gaussians uh, essentially doesn't change things. Um, in fact, it is slightly better to use random plus minus ones which have slightly smaller variance than Gaussians. Um, but I, I, I mean, I don't want to go into details at this moment, but you know, towards the end of the lecture, if there is more time, I'll explain why this is the case. But at the moment, think about this kind of intuitive stuff that if you have random plus minus ones, you can think about them as random Gaussians as well. Um, but okay, assuming that YI is really distributed as one over root D times a Gaussian, then basically Gaussians are very well concentrated. So yi squared will get most, you know, 1 over d is the normalization constant, times order log 1 over delta of probability of this 1 over 1 minus delta. And this follows just from the, you know, probability distribution function of the Gaussian variable. Okay? So this, this proves this lemma, right? This proves this trading around part. That yi, after multiplying by these two matrices, will actually uh, be roughly spread around. Um, so it remains only to use this projection matrix B. And uh, you know, the first question is, do we really need to use this projection B, right? Um, so, I mean, we did some kind of spreading around. We, perhaps we can just choose a few coordinates. So, I mean, we've taken the matrix, uh, like we've taken the vector, right? And uh, we rotated it somehow so that all the mass is kind of distributed around. Now, you know, supposedly if we just take, you know, first few coordinates, they, you know, should, uh, should take the, uh, the right amount of mass, right? I mean, the proportional amount, right amount of mass. So, you know, perhaps this can work, uh, rather than, you know, doing this in our projection matrix three. And, uh, Okay, so maybe we can just use a few coordinates, and each has, you know, nice distribution. So basically, each coordinate of yi has a very nice distribution, namely normal of x times a Gaussian. And this was exactly like the case, you know, in the original Jotman and Strauss lemma, and we just needed k of these things, right? So concentrate. Uh, so this sounds all good, except that these different coordinates are not really independent. Right? This is going back to this issue that we use much less independence, actually. Um, so y1, y2 are not independent because they are all dependent on the randomness in this matrix D, in this matrix D, right? Um, so it's a slight issue, right? The, at this moment, you know, you perhaps even ask your question, like, oh, have we achieved anything? You know, have we, have we completely broken the information? I mean, we have different coordinates, but they're dependent, you know, this could be a problem. Uh, so it is not really a problem because what we have done so far was just, a, just rotations. They have not changed the norm of x. So in particular, norm of y is exactly equal to the norm of x since h, h is a change of basis. It's just a rotation, right? Uh, and matrix D also multiplies each coordinate by plus minus one. It's also just a rotation. So it does not change the norm. Um, so, so at, at least we have not changed the norm, right? I mean, sorry, I'm just uh, remembering what step next. 
so okay, so okay, perhaps we need a projection matrix P, and um, you know just to restate exactly what we have so far, uh, so if we take you know the maximum entry y i squared is bounded by this with probability one minus d times delta. So d appears here because we have to do union bound over all d coordinates. Um, so the projection matrix that works at this moment is just to sample k prime, k prime random coordinates. So k prime is so it's a projection matrix that uh, maps from d coordinates to k prime coordinates. Um, so basically, the sparsity per row is one. We just we won't even touch all the entries of y. We'll just sample a few. And uh, and the idea is like the proof of this is, is really simple. It's just standard consideration. Okay, it's really simple once Graham proved prove Chernoff bound. Uh, since we need to use Chernoff bound. Um, so again, because the norm has not changed, we know that you know the first coordinate squared plus the second coordinate squared and so forth is equal to the norm of x, which by assumption was one. Um, so, so what we'll do, we'll just sample, we'll just sample a few of them. And the intuition is simple, right? So we have uh, each each of these entries, each of these you know y i squared, is upper bounded by some number, right? It is it is roughly equal to 1 over d times some factor larger, right? So we have, we have a sum with a lot of uh, terms, right? And each of these terms is not too large. So this means that we can sample just a few of them to approximate the entire sum. And if you plug in the numbers, uh, right, which is not you know, really useful to go through now, right? The, the right amount, you know, really coming from Chernobyl bound, uh, of entries of terms that we need to sample is something like d times m. Uh, so it depends on the dimension, it depends on m, what is the largest value. I mean, this should be intuitive, right? Um, and it depends on 1 over epsilon squared, which is kind of standard Chernoff bound time type factor, right? Times log 1 over delta times. For 1 plus epsilon approximation, we throw this to 1 minus delta. It's really that's it, right? And if you plug in again the numbers that we get the matrix M from the spreading around step, plug in here, what we get is something like one over epsilon squared times log squared one over delta. So in particular K prime is slightly small larger than the standard just with Charles lemma for the case. But you know, let's let's leave with this for the moment. So just to just to wrap up, again, uh, we obtained that z squared, so z uh, equal to this, the matrices times x squared is equal to one perception approximation of the of the original norm of x should be squared here. The probability at least something like if you collect all the probabilities one minus two d delta. Um, and the dimension of z, again, is this k prime, which is somewhat larger than the dimension, the ideal dimension that we should be achieving. But here is, uh, uh, okay, before that, so, and the total time, again, is something like d log d plus k prime. Right, so the first step times takes time d, so must, this requires the cluster transform, time d log d. And the last step, essentially projection to k prime coordinates. Takes time k prime. Um, so you might, you know, it's, it, it doesn't really achieve just in the South lemma at the moment because it achieves higher dimension. But the, the um, you know, the next extra step that you can do is that once you've done these dimension introduction to k prime dimensions, you can do another random dimension, just on the Strauss, as described at the beginning, with a dense matrix. Uh, just the regular one, and you can reduce to the optimal dimension, which is one over epsilon squared times log one over delta. Uh, and you know, it will require you a little bit more time to compute it. And you plug in this in general, to, in total, at the end, it will give you d log d plus k cubed, where this k cubed comes from doing this last step of applying regular just in the start.
Okay? And there has been a lot of work on doing this. In particular, um, so I think, uh, I mean, one of the, uh, so, so John Lampard will talk about, I think, well, at least mention some of like this paper, uh, which is some of, some of the, it's a little bit similar. Um, and uh, it's, it's particularly similar to the second step, like after the things have been spread around. Um, and uh, so some of the, and some of this, some of this work has been used in practice. So I guess this is, I mean, this is what uh, John will talk about how all this relates to, to practice actually. Uh, what I to mention that, uh, so there is some work on trying to remove, to reduce this K cubed, and I believe it has been reduced down to K, though don't quote me on this. Um, it should be, uh, sorry? It should be exactly K times K prime. Yeah, and K prime roughly is K squared. So log 1 over delta is essentially K, right? Let's, well, many parameters, like one easy upper bound is to say that k prime is roughly k squared, is at most k squared, right? All right, so say for constant epsilon, right, this is, this is roughly k squared, right? But it will even, I mean, even if this k prime were to be optimal, or close to optimal, right? I mean, we still need to do another dimension reduction to reduce to the optimal dimension, right? And that will take k squared time. <coughs> okay. Uh, so one aspect of this is that, I mean, it's much harder to remove this log g, right? Because all, I mean, all these approaches use a password transform, right? Uh, so there is some of his later work actually uh, works for the case when x itself is sparse. So you can, I mean, it's a natural question to say, can we do this faster if x itself is sparse? So for example, if x is, has two coordinates, two non-zero coordinates, then even original just and Strauss lemma would have taken just two times final dimension, right? Uh, you, you in particular you did not need d log d, right? So some of the later work has been looking at the situation when x itself is sparse and whether we can do in something like sparsity of x plus maybe k. Um, but yeah, when x is sparse, it's very close to already being mapped down to the lower dimension. Sorry? When x is sparse, it's, it's pretty close to already being mapped down to a lower dimension. So in some sense that's true, uh, where, but there are situations where d is really, really large yeah. and uh, x is reasonably sparse. Okay. So, I mean, there are many situations where d, the dimension, so if you take text, for example, and you take words and you try to embed it into, into some vector, then oftentimes you can think about the different dimensions as corresponding to different words in the dictionary. Okay. And each coordinate will correspond how many words of that type or this particular word appears, right? So this means that your uh, non, the number of non zeros in a, in a vector x will be maybe hundreds or, you know, depends on how long you, is your text, for example. But the dimension d can be tens of thousands, right? Depends on the dictionary size of the language, right? So you don't really want necessarily to be linear in dimension d and you, you know, hundred dimension, hundred dimension of a hundred is still quite a lot, so you might want to reduce it as well. Um, I, I believe John actually will talk exactly about these kind of situations uh, tomorrow. Um, all right, so in, in the last few minutes, I just wanted to kind of talk about, yes. Uh, so you said reduce it to optimal k, so does that mean that this k is actually the best you can hope for? This, this, oh, this case, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, very good point, I forgot to mention this. Uh, yes, this has been proven to be optimal. You cannot reduce dimension to less than this without breaking <coughs> um, However, in, in practice, people do try to reduce dimension to less than that. And sometimes, sometimes it works. <laughs> I 
Uh, okay, well, often I forget actually, right? Um, yeah, I mean, okay, I didn't want to touch the subject, uh, but uh, in practice, uh, people usually do not use too much random dimensional introduction. Usually, we'll use dimensional introductions that you can set up as some kind of optimization question, right? So you can think about like maybe for my particular data set, for my particular endpoints, I can reduce the dimension even further just because my points are kind of nice. Yeah. Maybe they are essentially, you know, I have these images, right, and, and stuff, right, but they are maybe kind of the, generally speaking, they are kind of three-dimensional objects, right, or they, they are close to being three-dimensional. So I can reduce to two dimension three, actually, as opposed to this bound. And uh, there is a lot of work, especially more in the machine learning community, where people will set up the problem this way and say, like, okay, what is the, let me set up this an optimization question. Oftentimes it's kind of empty hard problems and you relax it and then you get some kind of approximation. Right? Uh, oftentimes, okay, almost always you can't prove anything about this kind of methods, even though in practice they, they work. And it's actually a good kind of good meta question to try to bridge these kind of two points, two perspectives, where in theory we can get bounds that work exactly right, whereas in practice, oftentimes, because of niceness of your data set, you can reduce dimension to much less, except that you cannot prove anything. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this actually tomorrow. You know, mm -hmm. Sorry? Reduce No, no, there are more complex. They will look at the data. Like principal component analysis is the best example. Yes. But that is much more expensive time, right? No, not necessarily. Principal component analysis is actually relatively fast to complete. <coughs> because you have to do SVD of a matrix which is D by D. So it is. Computing the metrics will take you time linear in n. But computing the single or the top value is of a relatively small matrix actually. But we can talk about this for time. Um, okay, so I want to, you know, talking about the rational reduction, I should talk about the rational reduction in other spaces except for Euclidean space. So, so far, we have really been talking only about Euclidean space, right? What about other drones? In particular, one of the motivating examples was this Hemming space, or maybe a one space. Um, so this is roughly, you know, kind of how many people think about just in Strauss lemma, is that, you know, up to epsilon, right, you can reduce dimension to log n. And it's oblivious randomized and works with high probability. So can we do the same for other metrics? In particular, other nodes such as L1. Right? So L1 is just the sum of difference of absolute values of differences between different coordinates. It's a norm of choice in certain other applications. And the answer is that essentially no. Uh, so there has been quite a lot of work on this and you know negative results. Um, in particular, there is uh, uh, there's a paper, uh, I believe, uh, Johnson Nower, um, who proved that essentially if you, a statement of the sort of, if you have a dimension reduction that is as powerful as Johnson and Strauss, then your metric or norm is really very close to Euclidean. So it's a very strong of, of form of lower bound. And for a one which is, you know, a norm, it, it connects to things like class or aggression, kind of stuff, right? Which would be very useful to have such kind of dimension reduction for it. Uh, there has been more work kind of trying to pin down exactly what is known. And for example, for dimension D, for approximation, for approximation D, you know, the current bounds are somewhere between here. And this is even if your dimension reduction takes into consideration the actual endpoints that you have, not even on uh, So this is, in the upper bound is something like n divided by D. So for one perception of approximation, this is this is nothing. This is order n dimension. This is very different from order log n. And um, just I'll uh, quickly say that 
kind of to connect back to, to Graham's lecture. So for a model, you can do slightly different things that looks a lot like dimension reduction, but is not really a dimension reduction. Um, so, so here is one thing that is is not really like the Schaus lemma. It doesn't achieve high probability uh, high probability statement, but it achieves something, and it is useful in many applications. Uh, so what is the analog of Euclidean projections in L1? Uh, so you know how you know from algorithmic point of perspective, kind of okay, can we do a similar kind of things for L1? In particular. What do we need? What did we use? Kind of the main property in Euclidean space that we use is this Gaussian projections, where we said we take these Gaussian vectors and we take our one-dimensional uh, one-dimensional uh, projection was really a product between a Gaussian vector and our you know input vector x1, I mean x uh, coordinates x1, x2, x3, x3, and we said that it has stability property where v sum is distributed as g times normal x, L2 normal x, right? So there is a natural question, you know, now you can, you know, pull out your MacBooks and say, are there distributions similar to G, where, you know, I would replace, this will not be G, but some other distribution, such that this sum is distributed as something times one norm of x. Okay, it's a valid question. And, uh, and yes, there is, there is such a distribution, it's called Cauchy distribution, uh, and it is one stable. Um, this is too stable because this is too norm. This is one stable. Essentially, if C1, C2 up to CD is distributed as a Cauchy distribution, now I'll tell you in a second what it is exactly, then this sum is distributed as another Cauchy distribution times one norm of X. Right? So this looks awfully like this, right? I mean, and it should be useful. And this is what is the Cauchy distribution. So this is the PDF of the distribution. It is essentially up to normalization, one over X squared plus one. And uh, I mean, you can parameterize it with some parameters, right? But I mean, take a look, for example, at this. What is the right one? This uh, violet thing. This is a picture from Wikipedia, so a little bit more graphs than I needed. But this violet one is exactly the Cauchy distribution uh, as described here. And uh, you know, now the question is, why why don't we just take this Cauchy distribution, plug it in where we did Gaussians before, and not get the mesh reduction for for L2? And uh, so what's wrong? The problem is that Cauchy distribution in contrast to the Gaussian distribution is heavy tail. So it's something like one over x squared plus one as opposed to Gaussian that are distributed decay exponentially. And because of this, the Cauchy distributions don't even have an expectation. You, can, you don't even have expectation of the absolute value of the Cauchy distribution. Uh, and, uh, and basically you can't get the type of concentration that you were getting from for Gaussian. Um, but this is use, this is still useful in many applications and I mean this kind of, the idea of using one stable distributions for, for approximating L1 norms has been introduced by in the year 2000. And uh, indeed you can take something like a map as before, exactly like multiplying by Cauchy vectors, uh, and you'll get exactly the same kind of statement that each coordinate is distributed as one norm of X times a Cauchy. Uh, again, one norm of fx will not concentrate as before, so we don't have the same thing as the previous sum of squares of Gaussians would concentrate. Um, but you can estimate the norm of x, uh, basically well, one norm of x from these other facts by taking the median of absolute values of coordinates. And this is something that I mentioned that is very useful in streaming. So instead of, so it is not a, a, a dimension reduction in the sense of we don't map back into a one. We map into some space. I mean, basically, it is a sketch. It is not. It is not exactly a dimension reduction. But you know, it's a. You can think about this as a form of dimension reduction. Uh, just that the estimate that you make at the end is not computing one norm of, of f of x, but taking the median of absolute values. And basically, I'm going to mention why median works. So I will repeat. Um, and again, this gives a sketch. So, for example. This kind of sketch is already useful for nearest neighbor search computation. As I mentioned, you know, going from kind of trivial scan to slightly less trivial scan where you first do dimension reduction and then do the scan. Uh, since once we do the scan, we don't really care which 
exactly how do we exactly compute the distance between our query and the data? Uh, all right, I'll, I'll end here. <laughs>